timings for that. I haven't asked Ryan and Lizzie, is it Augustine or Augustine? Augustine. Augustine. That's right. That's the appropriate pronunciation. All right. So that was a little Augustine. He was, he was exemplifying for all of us the kind of attention we should have been giving right, to what was going on. He was fixated on uh, the Advent candles. So very good. Well, welcome, everyone. My name is Greg Kowser. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, it is good to see uh, some familiar faces. I uh, right, see the Kriegers. It's good to see them here. Uh, and so that's our, one of our ongoing connections to Togo. Uh, one of the unusual things about EBC in our history is that we have had a, uh, a connection to Togo, West Africa for, I don't know, three or four decades now. Uh, actively being involved there. We have two missionaries that we support in Togo, uh, Sharon Rahali and Melissa Friesen that are still there. Uh, so we've had also a long-term connection with medical missions in particular, and uh, the Pivisons are here as a part of that. Sharon and Melissa are both nurses in two different hospitals in uh, Mongo, even though Sharon right now is serving up in Mongo uh, in nurses training. So we've had uh, a foothold uh, in uh, Africa and in Bangladesh uh, in different areas where we have been involved as a church. It's good to see Pivotsons today and the Kriegers, uh, and uh, I often pray regularly for Melissa and Sharon and their mission uh, and what they're doing there. Well, today uh, we're going to be in an unusual passage when it comes to Christmas passages. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, any of you that, that know me and have been around for a long time, you know that uh, I love First and Second Timothy and Titus, and somebody might say, of course, Greg would find some Christmas passage in First Timothy, right? Because uh, everything is in First Timothy or Second Timothy or Titus. Uh, but it truly is a Christmas passage, and one uh, that in another venue I was asked to write a little devotional with regards to this, and it just spurred my thinking uh, to make it the focus of what we were going to talk about today. Um, uh, I hope... Uh, that indeed you're enjoying this season. I know for Ron and I, we're in, in the process of a transition. Many of you know we sold our home and we're moving uh, to another home, but we're in a rental home in the in-between. Uh, Ron and I have never owned a house that didn't need sig significant work. Whoops, I just died here. The, uh, uh, I don't think so. Let me just use the handheld mic. Let me use a handheld. Hello? Okay, there we go. We're back. All right. So, okay. Uh, so we're in the midst of a transition ourselves, and so we feel like we're in chaos right here in the moment in our, our Christmas celebrations. I told Rana uh, I hadn't really even thought too much about it being Christmas. Uh, so uh, uh, it was nice to get in the car this morning, listen to some Christmas music and come to church and sing some because I've just kind of had too many other things that have kind of drowned out the season. Uh, I'm still finishing up my semester as a professor at Cedarville, and I still have to uh, inflict some grades on some students beginning this uh, uh, week. So I still have some Greek finals to grade and some papers to grade. So I have so, uh, some busy week ahead of me. Uh, but I'm looking forward to actually getting a break and sitting back and enjoying uh, this season and thinking about uh, this time of year. But I know for many of you, it's, it's very similar. You're busy buying gifts or busy making plans to travel or thinking through the kind of dynamics of what your celebrations will be. Uh, and of course, for us, uh, our society and our culture does not want us uh, to give time for God to intrude into those celebrations. And so today, we're, we want to give time to reflect on the fact that the reason why, uh, and even a, a small little grace and a little bit of an echo of a past, is that our culture still uh, gives us space to celebrate it, even though it's become more and more of a contentious moment. But for us as Christians, it should be something uh, that we enter into with real delight and joy and with a sense of relief and hope uh, as we come to the time of Advent. You know, one of the, one of the things about uh, stories that everybody loves uh, is they love rescue stories, plots that involve some hero rescuing people that are in peril. And I, in particular, uh, I loved when I was growing up watching Westerns, uh, and I would see that. And one of the classic uh, Western plots centers around this little town that's dominated by these outlaws. 
uh, usually a bad gang of people run by a bad person. So they kill, they rob, they threaten, they abuse the people of the town, and the people you know, cower in fear. There's always right, a few heroic people, a few bold souls who try to throw off the bad guys, but inevitably they get crushed and get overwhelmed. And so at the heart of the plot is, you know, is somebody going to show up? Is there going to be a gunfighter, a marshal, somebody who's going to show up? And for me, a lot of those times when I was young was, will John Wayne finally show up to deliver the people, right? Uh, he was one of those characters that was often the guy who showed up uh, to deliver the people. Um, and it, it, you're waiting, you're waiting, and just when it looks like all hope is gone, the hero rides onto the scene, he fights all the bad guys, and then the innocent are protected, the bad guys are judged, and all things are right in the world, right, when you think about that. So when you watch that story, uh, you cheer about it, but when we come to the Christmas story, it is a rescue story, but it's an, a rescue story very, very unlike many of the Westerns. So let me, let me paint you the rescue story that's here. Uh, and it's a, it's a portrait of a kind of love that is breathtaking. Right? It's a kind of love that is breathtaking. So here's how I sketched it out to myself as the story. The setting for the story is the world we live in. And like the Western, the Earth's inhabitants then and now are oppressed, harassed, and threatened with death mentally and physically day in and day out. Right? One of the things that is characteristic of our moment is the, the, the ascending, the, the increasing numbers of people who are dealing with mental illness. Matter of fact, everybody has a mental illness. The, the, uh, the, the uh, diagnoses have skyrocketed. Uh, the levels of, of uh, anxiety, right? I, I don't know how many, uh, I still as a professor, I follow some of my students and former people on Instagram, the only the people that I know that I'm connected with, but I cannot tell you how many times they reference this one word, and the one word is anxiety. Anxiety, 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 right? Now, depression is there, but not as often. One was a, a young girl that I still follow that was a member of our church here and has moved to another location, chronicled her year by 12 months of crises, of mental crises, Mo January, February, March, April, May, all the way through, right? And she's not alone. She's not alone in the culture we live. And so when we talk about death, not only are we facing, right, COVID, physical death, not only facing uh, all kinds of other things that are perennial issues, but, but people are dying psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, right, around us. So we, we live, the, this is the setting of the earth is, is threatened, right? Harassed and threatened day in and day out. It's unrelenting, right? Even as Sarah mentioned, right, in her prayer, um, as we come to the holidays, holidays, uh, you know, are, take us back to the good things of life and remind us of that. And sometimes it makes it especially painful when someone who was such a center point in the happiness of our lives is absent and we miss them. As a matter of fact, many of our Christmas memories are around what they contributed or their presence or the types of things that you enjoyed with them. And so the joy of the moment or the intensity of the moment actually intensifies our own grief and longing, right, for someone that we miss in terms of that. I see that in the life of my mother all the time at every Christmas. Uh, she misses uh, uh, her spouse of 60 years, uh, my dad. So, day in and day out, however, right, this is the twist on the plot. However, unlike the classic Western, there are no innocent or good townspeople. There's no innocent or good, the whole town is nothing but outlaws. It's a town of outlaws. They're all busy, and here I'm going to use a phrase that Paul uses for what it is to live apart from God, and you can see this in Titus chapter 3. They're all busy hating one another to some degree. And all are responsible for creating the chaotic, oppressive environment they live in. What's even worse, no matter how bad it gets, and it gets really bad, right? We don't have to listen to the news very long. It gets really bad. There are many who say and who believe that we can fix it ourselves. We can fix it. Yes, they will grant that there's some broken spots, some struggles, but it's not so bad that they cannot get themselves out of the trouble they're in. We can get ourselves out. 
when they get the spiritual powers on their side, right? even in our little town of Xenia, uh, there's people who are busy pursuing the spiritual powers right? in a very, what we would call, uh, uh, it's not really a new progressive way of looking at the life, it's actually returning to an old paganism. All right, so if we can just get the spiritual powers on our side, right, or the gods, right, or find the right person to be our champion, or you get the right government system in place, if we just get the right government system in place, and that's why so many people are invested in it, because that's going to bring about human flourishing. Or when they can succeed in getting the opposition, the people who don't like what they're doing, to bow their knee, knee, kneel, their knee and celebrate them, they have every confidence that they're going to be able to write everything, right? So we don't need a deliverer, so they are the deliverers, right? Some human being is the deliverer, either me or the person that I pick. Somehow we can get ourselves out. And so behind this, right, we enter into a season where uh, people are promoting a life where God is either not there or he's one who affirms whatever they think is best, right? We live in a culture in a moment where God... Uh, speaks out of like 300 sides of his mouth because God affirms everything. And if God affirms everything, really God has really nothing to contribute. It's amazing how many people have God on their side in whatever choices that they make. So there's no good or all-powerful or sovereign God and the life should be lived, right? Your life should be lived unconstrained by any boundaries given by God and without fear of any ultimate accountability to God. It's because God is not... Uh, the key figure. So this is life is all there is, and you better make of it what you can. So we live in that kind of moment where in the rescue story of the scriptures is he's coming to a town of outlaws. So all in all, there's little about the scene that would compel much compassion. The people have made a mess of their lives. You could understand someone coming to rescue them if they were upright or good people, but who would want to rescue people who are foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures, people living in malice and envy, being hated, and hating one another? Right, so this is the rescue story that we have. We have a story where the people right, are the outlaws. There are no innocent people in the town crying out for a marshal. There are only people who are in actual rebellion against the person who made them. And so it's not only a rescue story of good, innocent people trying to be delivered by somebody to come from the outside, it's actually the person who's coming to rescue them is the one they're hating and rebelling against. So this is a dramatic rescue story, and this is the one that we enter into when we read the passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And Paul is telling the story as a former outlaw. He's telling the story as a former outlaw. He's speaking about from the past. As a matter of fact, he's going to describe himself in very graphic terms, right? And I just want to say this to us as we think about Paul, right? When Paul, he's very famous for the idea of speaking himself as the chief of sinners. And somebody said, well, that's kind of hyperbole, right? Uh, put myself at the top of the heap, uh, right? The, the best of the worst, if you want to put it that way. But some of us, we need to think very clearly about who Paul was and what his past was like. He's going to use a term that describes himself as a violent man. And it's a term that's often uh, associated with someone who's willing to shed blood. And so Paul was literally a man who had blood on his hands, right? Many of you remember, right, the first time that Paul shows up in Scripture is where? Remember him? Yeah, it's at Stephen Stoning, right? Stephen uh, was the first Christian after Jesus, the first Christian to be killed for his faith in Jesus. And Stephen was not killed by a group of strangers who didn't know him. Stephen was very likely killed by the people that he went to synagogue with, the people who knew him by name, because they had rejected the Messiah that he embraced. And when they killed him, they stoned him, right? And when you stone someone, and Paul, of course, shows up there uh, the first time, Saul, who shows up there and he's holding the cloaks of people. He's assenting to and facilitating the, the killing of Stephen in the most brutal public kind of way. So Stephen's sitting there, right? The famous scene, you can read about it in Acts chapter 7. He's sitting there praying uh, and, and, and asking God's mercy on the people who are killing him. And they're standing over him in close proximity, picking up large stones and, and crushing the life out of him. 
right, by a communal judgment, right? And Paul is there. And then Paul, right, when he meets Jesus, he's on the road to Damascus, and Paul is busy hounding Christians door to door to try to bring them to their knees and crush this movement that he sees as a blasphemous misrepresentation of the God that he serves, right? So Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, I tried the fullest of my ability. I tried to destroy the church. I tried to destroy it, right? So when Paul speaks here, he speaks from a a person that literally, right, he's got blood on his hands uh, as he speaks here. So would you stand with me? And we're going to read this passage together in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. And we want to look at it in terms of the portrait of the love of God that is painted in 1 Timothy. Timothy 1, 12 to 17. So here's begin, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, I know you have, uh, if you received a bulletin when you came in, you'll find a sheet there that you can take some notes on, uh, and I would encourage you to do that, uh, to reflect on uh, either in your groups if you're continuing to meet through this holiday season or for your families or uh, for yourself personally to reflect on Uh, some of the key points from uh, this passage. So we're talking here now about Christ's coming. And we're going to center it, right? The Christmas verse is right here in verse 15. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Okay, so we want to talk a little bit about what we see here. Now, if you notice, if you look at this passage, I want to see a couple things. One of the things that's important always, right? This is the Bible side, teacher side of me is always to pay attention to the surroundings, right? Pay attention to what's around it. And there's something that's very interesting here. If you look back in verse 11, just before you get to this passage, it says here, that conforms to the gospel. Here he's giving some instruction to Timothy uh, about the proper use of the scriptures that are informed by, the Old Testament scriptures, that are informed by what Jesus has now done, right? That it should be read in light of what Jesus has now done. But he says here that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Okay, So the gospel is a proclamation. It is a uh, proclamation and demonstration of God's glory. And it's not, it's not surprising then that he ends the passage in verse 17 with a doxology, which is a, a, little, a little praise statement that celebrates God's character and his glory. So Paul uses glory here uh, to talk about the sum total of God's excellencies, his character. So the gospel, he wants to say, is a declaration of God's excellencies, his character. You get to see God's character displayed when you hear the story of the gospel. So it gives us a portrait of God in his heart. So everything that he's going to say, and this is our first point in our little outline here, is everything that he's going to talk about, he's going to talk about God's plan. This is God's plan. It's part of God's plan. So Jesus' coming wasn't something that was was on his own. It wasn't something that that he just decided on himself, right? It wasn't something that he was forced to do by some other entity, but it was God's plan. And and uh, throughout all of Scripture, if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one of the things you're always going to find Jesus saying over and over and over again is that I have come to do the Father's will. I have come to do the Father's will. Everything that Jesus did was governed by him coming, 
Everything in his life was governed by the timing of his ministry, the nature of his ministry, the goal of his ministry. Everything that he did was a part of God's plan, right? So Jesus, you'll find him, and the Gospel of Luke emphasizes this most. It used this little word, everything. Jesus always is saying, I have to do this. This must be done. And the first time that Luke uses that is when Jesus is in the temple, right, is this kind of... uh, Uh, He seems to be this little uh, full of himself young man at the age of 12, right? And he's sitting there dialoguing with the rabbis, having a conversation with them. The backstory is, of course, his mom and dad have have moved off about a day's journey or more. uh, And they thought Jesus is playing with the rest of the family. And then they discover he's not anywhere to be found. uh, And then Mary's just a little freaked out because she's lost the son of God, which is a little, you know, a little disturbing. Like Joseph, we've lost the son of God, right? That's a little disturbing. Um, and so they, they, they make their way back. They find Jesus having this conversation. And then Jesus says this, which seems like a, you know, if I was in a British environment, I'd say a cheeky comment, right? A little sassy comment that he seems to make to Mary when he says, Mom, right, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Right now, if I'd said that, I never tried that on my dad when I was young, right? <laughs> Try to get out of some responsibility and say, hey, Dad, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? I'm going to give you some father's business, right? I'm going to give you some father's business right now. But, but Jesus, right, this is Mary in the story of Mary. Mary had been seeing these crazy things about this child all along the way. And this wasn't unusual for her. And what happens, Mary, as a good disciple, someone who's, who, who believes in God, the, the, the young woman who said, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She, she processes that and treasures it in her heart, and she kind of stores it up to think about what it says about this, this child, right? And so Luke intro- introduces this idea that Jesus is driven by what must happen in order to fulfill the Father's will. Everything about that. And so what we want to see here is that, that, that Christmas is a part of the grand plan of a sovereign God who's working out some, so it's not going to be surprising when we get to the end that he's going to give a praise to the God who is the king over the ages, the eternal king. It's his sovereign rule, right? And something for us to know that this is God's plan. The second one here, if we come in, is that it put into effect by God's heart, okay? Now, I want you to put a heart in quotes because I'm going to do a, a play on the word heart here for a moment, Okay? It's put into effect by God's heart, okay? Because one, I want to say, is that it's put in by God's heart. It's his delight, right? It was his good pleasure to bring about this rescue, right? And, and this, is, this is what is so good about it. We often talk about in theological circles, you talk about God being free. And what they mean by that is that there's nothing external to God that can force him to do anything, right? He doesn't do things because he's compelled by some external force, no one can, can arrest him to do their will. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about that. That's one of the things that he's going to say when he says God's invisible, right? What does he mean by God invisible? Okay, we'll talk about that. But one of the things is here is that, is that nobody can force God to do anything. And matter of fact, there's nothing about the people that Jesus is going to rescue that would compel his compassion, right? We're going to, the, when we start up our Roman series, In Romans chapter 5, I alluded to that when I was introducing things here. Paul's going to celebrate God's love. And he said, for for a righteous person, someone might die. Okay, maybe. But but, uh, just a person who's always righteous or right doesn't often compel much compassion to people. They often look at them as holier-than-thou sort of people. Then he goes to another level. And for a good person, someone might even dare to die. But God commends his love toward us in that while we are yet sinners Christ died for us right so the issue here there's nothing about them so what what's motivating God it's his own heart it's his own love right if you flip over right you might not have to flip over just continue if you go down to chapter two right Paul's going to make this explicit when he talks about the heart of God notice what he says in verse three This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom, the price that was paid to deliver us from the slavery to our own willful bondage to sin. 
for all people. This has now been witnessed in his own call. Paul's call testifies to the fact that God wants all people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Why? Because Paul was the Jew who was appointed to be the apostle to the rest of the world, the Gentiles. So Paul knows that by his own experience. So it's God's heart, right? It's his desire It's his good pleasure, is the the term that Paul would use in Ephesians 1. It's his good pleasure, right, to see rebels rescued and restored. That's his heart. That's his delight, okay? The second way I want to use the term heart, right, is it's put into effect by God's heart. Well, who is the apple of God's eye? It's the Son. It's Jesus. Jesus, right, God's heart is manifested in his heart, Jesus, giving his life for us, okay? Now, we're going to emphasize here, Jesus doesn't come, right, as someone compelled against his will. He's not forced to do that. It's Jesus, he has the same heart that God has, so he comes to do the Father's will with the Father's heart, right? So, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, an agreement, right, between the members of the Trinity, So it's put into effect by God's heart. It's his good pleasure that is manifested in his will, right? So that Jesus comes with the heart of God to do the will of God to rescue rebels. So it's put into effect by God's heart. This is one of the things that's happening here, right? Is that when Jesus came, we read it in our Advent, he came into the darkness. And the darkness, like the darkness, because their deeds were evil. And when, they came, when Jesus came into the darkness and brought the light of the light of men, he was rejected by the darkness. He came to his own. This is the beginning of John 1. He came to his own, and his own would not receive him. Right? So this is no rescue mission where you've got people crying out for the deliverer who come. You've got people in distress and difficulty, but the one place they're not going to look is to the God who created them, right? So it's God's heart, it's His good pleasure to send the Son, which is His heart. And so this is why Jesus is often described as the beloved one, the beloved one, right? Jesus comes, right? The third thing is this coming of Jesus provides a pattern for God's ongoing mission, His ongoing mission is the term you want to fill in there. Now, I want you to look here at what Paul says here about this event, okay? Now, if you read through the Scriptures, Paul never got over what God did for him, right? He never got over it. And I say this to all of us who are followers of Jesus. There are many things in life you should never get over, and this is one you should never get over. You should never get over And it gets richer and deeper the older you grow and the more you understand what God has done for you in Christ, who you were before Christ saved you and what he has done for you and what he is doing for you and what he will do for you, right? It's something that your wonder at it should continue to grow. It's something that you should never get over, right? I always remember remember the, the disciples when Jesus sent them out the first time. He gave them authority to represent him, and they went out and they cast out some demons, they did some miracles, they did some things that made them authorized, showed that they were authorized representatives of the king, the cosmic king who had authority over everything. So they went out and did that, and they came back so pumped about the cool things they were able to do, and Jesus kind of puts a little kibosh on all their little celebrations and says, you know, you guys, all right, these are, these are cool. But the, most thing, the thing that you should be most celebrating is that your names are written down in the book of life. After that, everything else is gravy. Everything else is etc. right? And so, and I say this to us, some of you who grew up in the church, and I say this to young people and myself, you grew up in the church, you've come to take for granted the, the miracle that he took you as a rebel and he made you a son. He made you a daughter. He took you that you deserved everything that that God's wrath would pour out on you, and he took that into himself so that you wouldn't have to experience and gave you life now and forever. 
He's taken everything that truly threatens you out of your future. He's promised you everything that you uh, long for and have been created for will be realized. And he has provided you guidance and power by the Spirit to live into it the best we can this side of heaven. And so this is where we are. And Paul never got over it. And when you see Paul, I don't know, the book of Acts almost makes us think that every time Paul got a chance to share the gospel with somebody, he started off with his testimony. Okay? You can read about it in Acts chapter 9. You can read about it in Acts chapter 22. You can read about it in Acts chapter 26. It just goes over and over again. Every time Paul gets a chance to speak, he said, I used to be this kind of man. This is what happened to me. And I want to tell you about this Jesus. Right? And you can read about his testimony in Galatians chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Right? You can just go over and over. Paul never got over what God did for him. Right? And so this is, this is one of those things here. But Paul says there's something else at work here because he sees the hand of God in the unique role that he played. And look here in, in chapter 1, what he says here. He says, uh, here is a trustworthy saying, verse 15, that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Okay? So Paul sees himself as a depiction of the way that God goes about saving. He, his own life is an illustration of why Jesus came and what he wants to do. So, he recognizes that God did what God did in rescuing him, the worst of sinners, was intended to give a picture of the great lengths to which God has gone and continues to go to restore and reclaim rebels. Right? I, I was hearing Sarah talking about uh, this Christmas season and thinking about you know, who in your sphere of influence does God want you to pay attention to? One, one of the prayers that Ron and I have been praying for our, ourselves this fall is we've been praying as we've, uh, uh, now we're, we're, not, we're not walking together anymore. Uh, we're scooting together, uh, but we're not walking together anymore. Rana broke her uh, leg a little while ago, or actually her ankle, uh, and so we're not doing any uh, walking up and down the road anymore. Uh, and most of the time we're in the car together and we're praying together. Uh, but one of the things we've kept asking God over the time is, you know, God, give us eyes to see the people in our day that you want us to pay attention to. Because we see a lot of different people in the day, right? Ron is in a classroom, multiple classrooms with different eighth graders, right, who all want to be seen, even though some of them act like they don't want to be seen, right? And so I'm with college students, I'm, I'm with people from the church, um, I have some elders that are extremely difficult to deal with, you know, those kinds of things like that. Uh, but, you know, wh who, who is it that I need to see today? Because I will see some people and greet them basically, but there are other people that I need to tend to differently. There's other people that I need to not miss that they're really in, in a difficult way. Or there's other people that I need to listen to because they have something that God wants to say to me through them. And so I've been asking God, God, help us to see people. Oh, sorry, I almost fell over. And the issue that Sarah was talking about here is that, well, who is it at Christmas time that, that God wants you to see? And maybe we need to go a little bit out of our way to do that. And I want to just say to you that God went way out of his way. Way out of his way. And, and one of the things that, that's, that's difficult, right, with outlaws, which we all were who know Jesus Christ, is that sometimes loving us was really difficult. Loving us was really difficult. But thank God for whoever it was who patiently loved us and introduced us to Jesus. Because they, they got the message of Paul's conversion. Because Paul was a demonstration of the unimaginable patience of God. You know, I don't know if you, you pray this yourself, and I, I ask God not to, to let me use this as an excuse. But one of the things that's celebrated throughout the Old Testament over and over again is, God, I'm just so grateful that you are rich in mercy and slow to anger. God, you are rich in mercy and slow to anger. Right? David's prayer, Lord, thank you, Lord, that you do not treat us in the way our sins deserve. Right? God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your patience. Right? And sometimes, right, as we read as Paul was rebuking his contemporary Jews, sometimes we take God's patience 
right? His long-suffering graciousness. And then we take that as some sort of permission because apparently God didn't see or he's not going to do anything. And Paul says, don't let God's patience be neglected, right? His patience, his forbearance should turn you to repentance because he is patient and gracious. So God has gone and continues to go to great lengths to reclaim rebels. His life, Paul's life, displays God's astounding patience in withholding judgment and giving sinners grace, unmerited favor in its place, right? Did you notice what it says about in verse 14? The grace of our, of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. So this grace right, came toward Paul, this unmerited favor, right, grace, it wasn't something he deserved, God extended it to him while he was, right, a blasphemer, a violent man, right, this is the kind of man he was, and so this saving favor granted him the faith to accept the truth about himself and about God and to put his trust in God. And it came with a change of heart so that he came to see God as the most important, valuable thing in life, to make God his first love, right? So God came with transforming power to bring him to his senses, move him to believe in Christ, right? And change his affections so that now, right, he loves God above all things, shapes and drives him. And it reminds me, right, of of our own. This is God's pattern. This is what he's still doing today, right? I don't know, over this holiday, what often happens, right? You get back together with some of your family, or at least your minds are drawn to your family. And there's always someone that maybe you've known for years and years and years, and you think, there's no hope, or I give up, right? I give up on them. I tried and I tried and tried. And some of the give up doesn't show up by you actually thinking about it. It's just that you walk into the holidays with absolutely no expectation of God doing anything. Right? Now, there's a bad way of walking into the holidays where you walk in and you think, I know that this year is going to change everything. Well, that's pretty naive. But on the other hand, the the belief that God can't change that person, that God can't, right, that grace can't awaken them, that they can't be changed from who they are, that's not the 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 Jesus of Paul. Paul was turned 180 degrees around. Anybody who would look at Paul would say, who's the most unlikely convert standing among us? Him, right? I think it's God's humor that he uses the uber Jew, right? The Jew who's trying to kill every Gentile and everybody else who's opposed to him and makes him the apostle to the Gentiles. And so here we have, right, Paul And it makes me think about, God, who have I got impatient with? Who have I lost patience with? Who do I not really pray for anymore? Who have I given up on? Who's just really a consummate irritation to me? I just just drive me crazy. I I just try to avoid them. Now, there's all kinds of wisdom about how you love people who are difficult, who are running from the Lord. But who have I lost patience with? Thank God he didn't lose patience with me. And he doesn't lose patience with us. Right? Because every day as as sons and daughters, one of the things that is a part of this life, this side of heaven, is sometimes my confession sounds so old. Meaning I've said the same things over and over again. Right? Thank God that he's patient. And this is a picture of that. Right? The next one here, fourth thing. It proclaims and resounds to God's glory. So Christ's plan, right? Christ's coming was a part of God's plan. And so it ultimately proclaims right, and gives glory to God, both of those, right, to proclaim his glory and to give glory to God. So God is to be praised, the glory of the blessed God, back in verse 11, is on display, his character is on display in the contents of the gospel, in its transforming power for those who believe, and in his call to his sermons to, pro- to proclaim it. So the, the very plan itself declares a God who likes to restore and reclaim rebels. It's his good pleasure to do that, right? That just proclaims who he is. And then it also reminds us that he's the God that can take people who are dead and bring them to life and turn them around. And then it's also a God that when he changes people, he doesn't just t- turn them into themselves or let them focus on them. He turns them outward toward other people who need Christ. 
So this is what God does, right? So he turns them around. So it declares the Father's merciful intervention in the world in Christ to rescue undeserving sinners, give them life, and enlist them in his saving mission, right? So the advent of Jesus not only came to rescue us, it came to enlist us, to expand, right, and proclaim the glory of God on display in the manger. Now, I want us to look at these, these qualities here that are, that are talked about with God. It says in the NIV, it says eternal king, okay? Uh, but I want you to understand that. I think what Paul's talking about here is that he's king who rules over the ages. He's not talking about a quality of God as much as God's sovereignty over the periods of history. God is the ruler who governs over every period of history. And as you look through Scripture, right, God is the God who rules from creation till consummation. And so it's celebrating that God is in control because Jesus' coming, right, is something that is fulfilling a plan of redemption that was initiated by God as soon as Adam and Eve fell. Right, so the, the, the Christmas ought to remind us, right, that God's in control, that he's ruling and reigning, that his promises are secure and safe. As, on the other side, so is his judgment secure and certain. God keeps his word and he has power to fulfill his word and no one can thwart him. And Jesus comes into the world, of course, right, as we talked about last week, in the midst where Augustus is busy trying to expand his empire, pad his coffers, all those things he thinks he's extending his power, he's extending his wealth, he's extending his renown, right, he's undergirding his rule, all the while he's facilitating the plan of the God of the ages to reclaim and restore the world. So this is the God who's ruling and reigning. So he's the king over the ages. Now here he comes into a bunch of other qualities, and I want you to see those in relationship to his rule. He says, immortal, invisible, the only God be honor and glory. Right? So here we have this savior king who rules over the ages, and it wants to say he alone is sovereign. None can challenge his rule. None can challenge his rule. He alone is sovereign. This is the only God. And then when it says immortal, what Paul's talking about here, he alone possesses immortal life. None can secure genuine life on their own terms. God is the one who grants that. So it's not talking about God's immortality. It's talking about the God who dispenses immortality, right? So when Paul talks about, when you think about our resurrection life, if you want to read about it in 1 Corinthians 15, when the mortal has put on immortality, well, who puts that immortality on? God does. It's the fulfillment of the eternal life that he's given us. Because in, in the scripture, eternal life is not primarily or even significantly never-ending life. Every human being is never-ending. What immortal, eternal life is, is a quality of life. It's a transformative quality of life that comes to us through belief in Jesus Christ by God's gift through the Spirit. It's what makes us new creations. It's what sets us off on a whole new trajectory. It gives us new appetites, new dispositions, new future, a new calling, a new sense of purpose and meaning, right? And Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it to the full, right? One day it's going to be consummated and that all that is mortal is going to be made immortal. And so today we've been transformed in our inner being, Right as we see the face of Jesus, as we grow in him, one day everything will be changed. Right? This is the immortal God. Right? The second thing is, he alone grants access to his rich presence and riches. None can see God unless he brings them into his presence. Right? This is what it means by invisible. It's not talking about God's spirit quality, that his being is spiritual, if you will. It's talking about the idea that no one can gain access and see him unless God invites them into his presence. No human machinations can bring him down. Nobody can ascend up into heaven and force themselves into their presence. God is invisible, and if he doesn't allow access to his presence, no one can get to him. Right? He's above us. You only come into the presence of God by invitation. This is why one of the things we, 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 we lose sight of, right, that we sing singing an and can it be, 
right, that we have access to the very presence of God as his children, that we're invited and welcomed and longed for and provided for and enriched and blessed because we have unique access to him. Because Jesus has taken God's wrath in him. So we get access. God has invited us into his presence. One day, it'll be consummated where we'll be in his presence apart from any barriers. Face to face, right? The vision of the new heavens and new earth. Right? This is the, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase in his message. Is that God moves into the neighborhood. Right? God's in the neighborhood. Right? We're not talking and praying to a God we cannot see. We are in his presence with anything hindering that presence. The very design for which God created us to enjoy him forever in his presence. So he's an invisible God because he's the only one that gains access. And third, it says about him uh, that... um, no, 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 three things. He's the ruler sovereign. He's the only one who possesses immortality. He's the only one who can grant access. And then Paul shows these to say that God alone has set the parameters of his saving plan, its nature and its timing, that Christ alone saves. Okay? There is salvation outside of none other because Christ is at the center of God's plan. I don't care where you read your Bible, you cannot get beyond Jesus. Okay, that's an audacious statement, but that's Jesus' own statement. There is salvation in no one other. Why? Because he is at the center of God's plan. How, sinners who are, are lost and, and, and need to be ransomed from the sin, need to be bought out of the slave market that they and themselves have put them in. Who can get them out? They can't get themselves out. They don't even want to get themselves out. God can rescue them, and only through Jesus, right? As we've said here before, there's only two ways you're going to get out from, you're going to experience God's wrath is either one, Jesus experiences it for you, or you experience it yourself. There are no two other ways. So Jesus is the center. All right, so let me come a couple thoughts here at the end for us to think away. The Christmas season, right, I want to ask God, let us ask God to enable us by His Spirit to see the event we celebrate as Paul and the early church did. Right? So, right, this is not some hopefully simple thing to bring Christ into Christmas. That's not what I'm trying to, trying to get after. Is, is I, wa- I want us that when Paul thinks about Christmas, it's a very rich, deep event for him. Okay? God enable us to center Christmas around the wonderful truth. Here's here, the wonderful truth that God the Father exercises his sovereign rule toward the reclamation and restoration of rebels, to restore and reclaim rebels. Christmas is a rescue mission to restore and reclaim rebels. That's an important thing. I don't want to forget that. So in obedience to the Father and with the heart of the Father, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, many of you know this is is an old thing, right? The, The word for sinner... Is, is has a notion of missing the mark, right? Many of you have heard that. Hamartia is the Greek word. This is hamartalos. It's just the, instead of sin, it's talking about the sinner, the person shaped by sin. Or the, the, the sinner is a person who knows the mark and deliberately misses it. It's not somebody who's just like the bumbling fool who trips and falls themselves over different things. They know the mark. They miss the mark deliberately. These are the people that, that Christ came after right, to reclaim sinners, his own name, right? You remember this in, in the story in Matthew. You will give his name, Jesus, Jesus, because why? He will save his people from their sins, right? So his name indicates his mission, right? He came to save those who were in sin. So here's next thing. God save us from sentimentalizing the manger, so that we fail to see the shadow of the cross over the cradle. The shadow of the cross over the cradle, right? It's a sweet story. We love to recount the story. We have wonderful, wonderful um, ways of, of adorning it. We love the beautiful Christmas decorations, 
right? And all those things are good. There's nothing wrong with those. But we need to put Philippians 2 back into the Christmas story, right? Philippians 2 is, is, tells the story of what a humbling humiliation the cradle was of Jesus, right? This was the, the Son of God who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped after, to challenge God's authority, but instead, right, he took on the form of a human. And he became obedient to God, even to the point of death, and not just death, but death on a cross. That's the story of Christmas, is the, is the God's heart on display in going to the uttermost to reclaim rebels. That's you and me. That's what he did. May our hearts know the relief and delight of a spirit-empowered grasp. That's the term. A spirit-empowered grasp of the truth that the sinners for which Christ came included you and me, some of the worst of the lot. Right? Now, here's what I, I think, I, I know, this is nothing new, right? You go through the Christmas story. If you're here today and you've heard something new, you just haven't been around church for very much. Now, there's nothing, I haven't said anything that somebody's going to, if you do walk away half the time and say, I've never heard that before, you should just raise a red flag and say, it's probably not true, right? If I come up with something that the church has never come up with for 2,000 years, right? That's not a good indicator, right? So you're hearing things that you've heard over and over again. It's the same dilemma that we have, but one of the effects of the fall, right, one of the images in G.K. Chesterton that I love so much, is that he thinks about that, that heaven, when you get to heaven, one of the images that he creates of heaven is the image that you get with a little child, right? If you've ever known, if you've ever not, not been wise, I'm speaking as a guy here at the moment, you walk into a group of little children, say they're two, three, four, five years old, and you grab one of them and start spinning them around, right? You grab them, you spin them around, you, you let them down, you know, and you, you enjoy while they go stumble off and fall down, Right? And then what do they want to do? What's the very next word out of their mouth? Again, again, again. And, and, and you know, you can again, again, and you have to end it. You have to, you have to distract them because they're just going to keep on going. And then if you've got, you got four or five more kids, they're going, me, 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 right? And they're all, they're all jumping in. You're, and finally, you know, you've lost your marbles and you're down on the ground. You're saying, I've got to do something else, right, in terms of that. And, and the thing about a child that, that's something that, that you see there at that moment is that the same thing is equally enjoyable every time I do it. And there's something about the fall that takes deep, rich truths and moves us to get over them somehow instead of just delighting in them over and over and over and over again. And matter of fact, the more you return to them by the Spirit's power, the richer they get the sweeter they get, maybe the more they produce tears or delight, right? Or the impulse to tell somebody about it. Oh, man, that's so good. I got to tell somebody about it. And so this is, this is what I mean by a spirit empowered, right? So Paul will pray this favorite praise in Ephesians 3. God, please, by your spirit, would you open the eyes of our heart so that we might comprehend the height and width and length and breadth of the love of Jesus. Right? Could God help us to get back inside of, right, the depth of what God has done for us in Christ? And then finally, as this wonderful truth of God's love in Christ reverberates in our souls, may it swell up and pour forth from our lives in joy-filled service and witness. Now, I just want to end here by saying, sometimes, sometimes witness is a verbal proclamation of the gospel where you tell people this story that God had this plan and it was in his heart to send the son he loved and it was in the son's heart because he agreed with the father to come and rescue people who hated them and so Jesus came and he was born as a, as a baby. He lived this perfect life. And then he went up onto the cross. And the reason why he went up on the cross is because we had sinned against the God who had made us. And so we had earned a, 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 a verdict of justice that we could not get out from under. So he went up to take that for us. 
And then he went in the grave and he came up three days later to demonstrate that he was this king who ruled over everything. And all we have to do to enter into the benefits of his life and his acts is to put our trust in him. Sometimes we get to tell that story. Sometimes we get the whole story. Uh, Pastor Steve was talking about uh, how uh, little Evie convicted him the other day uh, where he walked into a particular environment. We'll get into all the particulars. I'm telling Steve's story here. But he got in the environment and a particular person that was waiting on them uh, in a hotel where they were. Uh, Steve kind of was thinking in his mind, honestly, that this person, to speak in our own passage, is a very unlikely person in terms of wanting to hear the gospel. And so, um, but Evie didn't think so. So Evie got right up there and pulled out the little uh, I like pie, right, the little track that Steve wrote and said, hey, can I read this to you? And she said, well, sure. So she comes out around there, sits down with little Evie, and they go through, start reading through, right, this little track. And right in the middle of it, so we get Steve's story, well, he can correct me afterwards, but right in the middle of it, Right, uh, something happens. She has to go back to the desk, do some things. She does it, and Steve's suspicion was that would be the end of it. But instead, just as soon as she was finished, she came right back out and let Evie finish her story. Sometimes it's that. That sometimes it's that, but you know, more often, right? For many of us, it's being patient with the people in your life. It's putting them on your prayer list and keeping them on your prayer list. It's trusting that the God who could take Paul, a blasphemer, a violent man, hopeless, and God is a God with real deep patience. Maybe you need to put them back on your prayer list. Maybe you need to confess to God that you've given up on them. Right? So maybe it's just that. Maybe it's just that. Other ones is, is you, you, you show... Right, you show that by the simple things that you say and do. And there's a lot of different things. Some of that is just you pay attention to them. It's interesting. It's overwhelming that God pays attention to you, to you, to me, to you. He pays attention to you. He pays attention. And sometimes we can represent the heart of Jesus just by paying attention to people. And they might be hard to pay attention to. Right? Sometimes just paying attention. So God is long-suffering. He's patient. He gave us a pattern for our own life and mission. His heart goes out. Right? It goes out to people. Let me end by reading this. Come to chapter Titus chapter 3. And then David, can you come, please? Titus chapter 3. I've been in and around this passage today in regards to it. But this is what Paul says about those of us, right, who understand who we were and what God's done by Christ coming. So here in Titus chapter 3, in verse 3, let's begin here. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that now, having been justified by grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. That's what Jesus did at Christmas time. 